The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All the way in the back, hear me? Yeah? Okay. Good? All right, good. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker this morning. is uh, Joel Isler. Uh, Joel is a graduate student at the University of Georgia School of Social Work. Um, he's going to be speaking on, the, uh, on digital justice, how technology and free software can build communities and close the digital divide, or to help to close the digital divide. Without further ado. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for coming out. I appreciate you being here. Um, so um, I am here to discuss uh, the concept of uh, digital justice, uh, what it is, what it encompasses, and how I feel it'll be one of the most important social justice issues we face in the 21st century. Um, as with any subject, uh, in order to fully understand this, uh, we have to go to its foundational basis. Um, so, in order to talk about digital justice, we must talk about social justice. Um, what is social justice? How can it be defined? Um, there are several uh, definitions of social justice that have been used throughout history um, and social movements. Um, many will define social justice differently due to religious, economic, political, or social worldviews. However, many of these frameworks can be synthesized to the view that everyone deserves access to uh, equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. Um, I'm not going to deny that I'm coming to this from a leftist perspective. Uh, however, as mentioned, there are different perspectives from the left, right, and religious spectrums that advocate for social justice, but through different viewpoints and means of implementation. That being said, this does not mean that we cannot work together for the common good of society. Many postmodernist and contemporary philosophers and thinkers will criticize the theory of social justice in that it is a utopian ideal. But so too were the ideas of the advocates for American Indians in the face of genocide or the abolitionists lobbying and organizing against the institution of slavery or industrial workers fighting for equal rights and working conditions or women fighting for gender equality and the right to vote, and so on. Ideas such as these can only seem utopian to those that cannot see or choose not to see what can truly be accomplished. Social justice finds its roots in many ancient traditions, but most notably the ancient Abrahamic religions such as Judaism and Christianity, with theologians such as St. Thomas Aquinas and Rosmini Sarbati codifying the social justice framework into a gospel a gospel people were expect, expected to live by. Secular social justice ideas are rooted in the writings of the 20th century analytical philosopher John Rawls, who utilized a thought experiment called the veil of ignorance, which was an idea rooted in social contractarianism, which is the belief that the idea that individuals living within a society have a social obligation to contribute to it. Uh, John Rawls determined the morality of something through the reversal of societal roles and the viewing of them through this veil of ignorance. In his greatest work, Justice is Fairness, Rawls stated that every individual has an equal right to basic liberties, equality, and equality of opportunity. Rawls later reiterated, um, excuse me, I lost my story. he later reiterated and renewed his social justice framework in hopes that so he would scale back criticisms of his radical socio-political philosophy. So later he came up with a work called Justice is Fairness, a restatement where he declared that laissez-faire capitalism, welfare state capitalism, and so state socialism violate the principles of social justice and that more egalitarian democratic forms of government and citizen participation should take hold in order for social justice to be achieved. I'll repeat that last portion of the statement because it is important to the free framework of free software and sharing. 
egalitarian, democratic forms of government and citizen participation should take hold in order for social justice to be achieved. These are a necessity. Social justice has always had advocates and ad activists, and social justice activism has come in many different forms, from the charity of religious leaders to secular radical activists advocating and pressuring for social reform on behalf of those who do not have a voice. From the slaveholder turned advocate of American Indians Bartolome de las Casas to the pioneer settlement house social worker Jane Addams to the radical African American activist and outspoken critic of the American establishment Malcolm X to the act activist and outspoken critic and Free Software Foundation founder and creator of the GNU project Richard Stallman, social justice activists and activism have taken many different forms. And as with the elaborate example of Stallman who once said that helping other people is the basis of society the case for digital justice is here. So what is digital justice? How can it be defined? Is this really an issue? Uh, what about issues of hunger, famine, poverty, disease, early child death, and lack of education? You might be thinking all of these things. Um, all of these things are and will become intricately linked with technology as the so-called global village spreads. Technology is an extension of ourselves our primate ancestors used it to make their world better, and we can do the same. The globalization process would not have happened without the advent of technological booms of the 16th and 20th centuries. And whether or not you follow the ideology of Thomas Friedman or Naomi Klein with respect to the subject of globalization, it cannot be denied that it is not happening. Consider those that have a car and those that do not have a car. Look at how development occurred when cars became commonplace. An elite class developed, even with the affordable Ford motor car, in contrast to another class of individuals. This same, ha the same thing happened with the railroad and even the telephone. Development occurred around the extension of the railroad and the Eisenhower interstate system as well. Major cities and economic development boomed, whereas smaller areas that were underserved did not develop and were thus left out of cultural, technological, and economic opportunity. The Digital Justice Coalition of Detroit has laid out a nice framework for a definition of digital justice. Digital justice is the belief that all members in society have equal access to media and technology as producers and consumers. Digital justice is a belief that values different languages, dialects, and forms of communication. Digital justice is a belief that prioritizes the participation of people who have traditionally been excluded from access to media and technology. Digital justice is a belief that, that prioritizes and participation of people who have traditionally been excluded. And it also emphasizes the demystification of technology for regular people. The last point is key and has my emphasis. Digital justice emphasizes that media and members of society and technology should be free from restriction, it should be affordable for all members of society, and it should be shared and collectively owned. The concept of digital justice is gaining traction in many places. Finland, Estonia, Spain, and even the United Nations, realizing the importance of access to technology, have declared and drafted into law the concepts of access to technology and internet as a basic human right. Even with the network cables laid, the satellite connections established, and the digital communities created, there are still individuals who do not have access to technology and the internet. And what is even more of importance here to note is that resources are not the panacea to the problem of digital justice. It takes the courage and dedication of individuals to step forward and to advocate for those cut off in analog silence. Speaking globally, between 2005 and 2010, the number of internet users doubled. In the past year, the number of internet users worldwide surpassed two billion with half of those users being in low-income nations. Although these numbers seem impressive, and they, they are, uh, we still should not detract from the fact that there are still 29% of the population in high-income countries that do not have internet access, and 79% of the population in low-income countries that do not have internet access. Internet penetration is another issue to consider, especially in the continent of Africa, where internet penetration is at a pathetic 9.6% compared to the world average of 30, which is still low, and the developing country average of 21%. As of 
at the end of last year, there was an estimated 29.5% of the world population connected to the internet. Think about that, 29.5% of the entire globe is connected to the web, and everybody else is not. So we can see from these numbers that there is already a worrying class division of digital haves and have-nots developing. In high-income nations, individuals without a computer account for 29% of the population, and 34.4 uh, do not have access to the internet. And low-income nations, 77.5% don't have a computer, and 84.2% don't have internet. These statistics obviously correspond with one another. Uh, if you have a computer, you're likely to have access to the internet, right? Um, it's not always the case, though. The trend of internet penetration in high-income nations is growing, but not having access to the internet does not only mean a lack of penetration, it also means a lack of affordability. In the US, the number of one reason people do not have access to the internet is cost. When we see st statistics thrown around, even the ones I just mentioned, that you see up here, about penetration, computer and internet adoption are not always considered in these numbers. Uh, the city that I live in, which is Athens, Georgia, is considered to have a 100% penetration, but adoption is not 100%. And that's not ever accounted for in FCC or any other types of research. In the US, uh, individuals who do not have a computer or internet access are more likely to, have, to not have completed high school and be of a low income or socioeconomic background. So I've mentioned all these very interesting statistics. Hopefully you're still awake. You're still here with me, so that's good. Um, how are people um, using free standards and free software um, to promote digital justice and to close the, close the, the, the so-called digital divide? Um, we can first take a look within the free software movement um, begun in the 1980s. Um, none of us would be here in this room today uh, if it weren't for the efforts of free software advocates. Uh, we are greatly indebted to all the hackers, programmers, designers, developers, and organizers that dedicate their free time to develop a framework in which the freedom to share software can be protected as well as created. Through the billions of lines of code written, the graphics drawn, and the documentation composed, and millions of people that cannot afford commercial software or want the freedom to share and use their software however they want are allowed to do so. <clears throat> Although the free software desktop market is mostly relegated to the technologically savvy, it is fast becoming an alternative for people due to the great efforts made by digital justice activists in creating an easy to use desktop for the masses. We can see this with uh, Ubuntu especially, that's becoming a very popular Linux distribution and it's helping a lot of people. Um, the free and open framework of the software developed by free software activists and advocates has helped national governments and countries across the globe, especially in South America, Africa, and Eastern Europe, uh, break the chains of Microsoft and be able to do what they want to with their software. Um, another example of success in getting computers to those that cannot afford them can be found in the computer recycling movement. The computer recycling movement encompass, encompasses many aspects of the food not bombs movement, which emphasizes that the actions of corporate and government entities allow hunger to persist in the midst of abundance. The Food Not Bombs movement follows a Freegan philosophy that food um, that is bad is a relative term. Food Not Bombs aims to reclaim discarded and surplus food and distribute it to the poor, hungry, or anyone else wanting a reclaimed meal in conversation. The computer recycling movement, in response to planned obsolescence of technology and technology manufacturers and the Veblen culture of consumerism, follows an environmental, social, and economic justice framework that emphasizes that older computers are not necessarily junk and can be brought back to life, so to speak, with free software and a little care and love. The computer recycling movement believes that the actions of corporate and government entities allow digital dis disconnectedness to exist in the midst of technological abundance.
The earliest report of uh, recycling computers actually dates back to, from my research, 1993. But this operation was not a reclamation effort, so it was just a, uh, a way of getting rid of computers responsibly, you know, not throwing it in the trash like a lot of people do. Um, and I, I think that the efforts of the Portland, Oregon-based Free Geek, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, is one of the earliest examples of computer recycling and reclamation uh, that aims to seize older computer equipment, load free software onto it, and distribute it to low income people or the technologically disadvantaged. Free Geek's model has inspired hundreds of collective organizations to develop around the world, all of them working in different ways, but with the ultimate end, end goals in mind. Um, that is helping people. These organizations uh, refurbish tens of thousands of reclaimed computers and recycle hundreds of tons of e-waste in a responsible manner that doesn't use prison, child, or dangerous labor in recycling practices. The computer recycling movement allows individuals to become empowered through technology and for a computer to be saved from the junk heap. Um, I volunteer in, in Athens where the group called Free IT Athens, um, and this has given me kind of a first-hand look at uh, what computer recycling can really do for people. Um, Athens has a 39% poverty rate. Uh, it sits within one of the most, the poorest counties in the nation and was recently honored by Forbes magazine as one of the top unequal cities in terms of income. So it's an understatement to say that poor of Athens are in dire straits. And since 2005, uh, Free IT has distributed thousands of computers to people in Athens. Uh, this is a small dent in numbers, but a greater impact in people's lives. Uh, another uh, issue uh, that digital justice activists are working towards is wireless networking. See that on the bullet point there. Um, and it's a big problem we face in Athens. I know I mentioned 100% penetration, right? But not everybody can afford $40, $50 a month for a DSL connection, which pales in comparison to what they have in South Korea. Um, the lowest price for broadband is about $35 a month for a pathetic one megabit per second connection, and that's without promotions or bundled deals. You know, sometimes they'll give you a really cheap price at first, but then they'll jack up the price later. Um, so, there, I know I mentioned other countries um, have higher speeds. Twice that speed is available in Denmark and Canada for lower prices, and many Southeast Asian nations have significantly faster speeds, like 50 megabits, 100 megabits per second, for like $20 a month. Um, to me, this is inexcusable. There's no reason for that. So there are people that are trying different ways to getting people access to the internet. Um, and there are a number of ways of doing so. Um, some organizations have worked with local universities um, in expanding their networks into outlying areas. So they'll take their backbone and they'll connect it to people that live in the community outside of the university. Uh, others have lobbied their municipal governments for free uh, basic Wi-Fi. And others have implemented grassroots community-maintained wireless networks. Um, the community-maintained wireless network model is probably the best model, in my opinion, uh, because it empowers low and low income communities by putting the technology as well as the administration and responsibility of this technology in their hands. Essentially, it's a strength-based approach to closing the digital divide. In strength-based approach, I mean it takes the strengths that people have and shows them how to take care of themselves. Um, it's essential for an organization or collective efforts success that clients receiving services are empowered uh, they are part of the decision-making process and are allowed to guide the direction of the decision-making process so that it might help recipients in the most appropriate manner. This is also the most affordable and sustainable model of implementation for a small community such as a subsidized housing block. Uh, according to research conducted on community-based wireless networks, sustainability is considered to be a critical issue when addressing lack of internet access and the best model for continued success of the network and the community accessing it is through a network model that the users themselves play an active and participatory role in. Wireless mesh networks enable a continued community-based approach that fosters social interaction, and this social interaction enables continued social support. And these wireless mesh networks, they're catching on. Um, 
in St. Louis, Missouri, the WasabiNet project uh, established a publicly owned and maintained wireless network internet cooperative in one neighborhood. Um, the coverage area is, is it's small, uh, but the WasabiNet has been very successful in securing grant funding for its initial deployment of wireless services, as well as the provision of desktop computers for low-income families so they can have the internet as well as the computers to access. Um, another example is uh, 51 Open, which is a uh, community wireless network serving the East Bay region of San Francisco. And a really great story is in 2006, the Champaign-Urbana Community Wireless Network, a coalition of developers and community volunteers partnered with Southern California's Tribal Digital Village to establish a wireless mesh network covering the Mesa Grande Reservation, home of the Kumeyaay tribe. Uh, the network has supplied the reservation with much needed access to information and services. Um, the reservation has a 90% poverty rate. Uh, its remote location bars postal service and cellular phone coverage. Um, so getting wireless internet, at least to them, was a much needed implementation so they could connect with the outside world um, and access social services if they need, need to. Um, and lastly, the, the, the most relevant example I, I could find of a community-based uh, wireless network can be found in Michigan, where the previously mentioned Digital Justice Coalition installed a wireless mesh network in one Detroit community. The project used open mesh wireless networking uh, to provide affordable internet access through a shared infrastructure. This uh, easily implemented affordable network is a real example of how communities can use technologies and business models to extend internet access and improve, improve community cohesion. This is key, a key part of uh, having a wireless mesh network is that the community really does come together around it. They work together on learning how to implement it. They work together on how to maintain it. It becomes a community effort. The uh, Digital Justice Coalition found that this wireless mesh network uh, exceeded their expectations and that the implementation was fast and problem free. And an interesting finding from uh, the DJC was that the community engagement was actually uh, more dependent on familiarity with neighborhood collaboration than actually with technology itself. A key lesson gained from wireless network implementations is that the success for these wireless networks came from devoting the majority of time and resources to community engagement and development with technology used as a backbone and tool of support. Wireless mesh networking is an excellent model uh, it requires minimal resources and banks on a high rate of socialization and civic participation. Remember I had discussed cars and railroads and how they helped a certain group of people and not, and not another just by the sheer chance of location where they decided to build a road or where they decided to lay railroad tracks. There is a significant difference between even the technological implications of these analogies compared railroads, cars, and internet and computers. Computers and the internet differ from railroads, cars, and even telegraphs or telephones, and in that individuals do not necessarily have to be tied to the makers of these infrastructures and services. Many of us certainly are, in this digital age, uh, we pay for access to the internet through an ISP or telecom, uh, and we trade liberties for free services such as email or social networking. But the biggest difference between these past historical technological inequalities is that we as a people now have a choice over what we can do. We have control over the means of production. We have control over software. And we are beginning to have control over actual hardware through 3D printers and similar devices. And the free and open framework established by uh, free software activists helps build communities as seen through the efforts of online information and software collaboration, such as Wikipedia. It's a great example. Um, and computer recycling and open mesh network building. If we don't use collabor the collaborative framework, if we don't use this free and open framework, we will not achieve digital justice because, as John Rawls said, social justice is the first virtue of social systems and we are all a part of the social system we call modern society. 
the free collaborative framework set forth by the free software movement fits well into the established ideas about community development. Does everybody hear that community development term thrown around quite a lot? I'm sure you do. Um, it's, a, it's a buzzword for sure. Um, community development is an aim of social justice and requires community involvement when working with internal and external influences. Like free software, community development is a multifaceted comprehensive approach to community change. Community development aims to increase social capital, not yield maximum economic return for shareholders. The community development framework encourages using local resources in a way that enhances economic, social, and political opportunities while improving social conditions in a sustainable way. Community development frameworks are always implemented to increase social capital for the disadvantaged, to overcome crisis, or just to strengthen the community. Many social scientists, psychologists, anthropologists, and journalists argue that technology is beginning to isolate us in different ways. Many of them go by the mantra that the more digitally connected we are, the more socially disconnected we become. I don't believe this is really true. I believe that we are just changing the way in which we communicate, and technology is actually giving us more opportunities to broaden our social connections. I can log on to IRC and talk to somebody in China if I wanted to. Um, this would not have been possible without having a computer and an internet connection. Recent research is suggesting that I might be correct in my uh, humble assumptions. Studies are showing that technology is not as socially isolating as we think it is. Just take the surge in popularity of social networking in recent years as an example. People are beginning to realize and view computers and technology are an extension of ourselves, and they are a tool used to communicate with one another in a more efficient manner. With this movement toward becoming more digitally connected, we are reminded that there are billions of people without access to a commu computer and the internet. I don't remember that exact percentage, but I think it was 29.5 or something like that of people that are actually have internet access. I mean, that's a significantly small number. Um, and the ones that don't have ex access to the internet are the ones that are isolated, not us. It's our responsibility to bridge the divide so that this class system of digital haves and have nots does not continue does not grow. We as the technologically knowledgeable, many of you in here I believe are, are responsible for creating the engines of change for digital justice. We do not have to go out and create a wireless mesh network or found a computer recycling nonprofit to work towards digital justice. But we can do very small things, such as using free software exclusively, supporting free software projects through code con contribution, documentation, bug reporting, education, and even money. Money is good for, for free software. It, it does help. Um, we should reward those that contribute to free software projects so we continue to have free software. We should support free formats and boycott products that do not respect our freedoms. We should educate the public on the reality of the digital divide and that it is an issue of social justice and the dangers of so-called free services that exchange liberties for no-cost applications and services. If we do have the time, we can start a computer recycling operation or create a small computer lab at a local church or even upgrade an existing one with free software. We can help our neighbors with their computer woes via free software or open format alternatives. There are many different things we can do, but what we cannot do is sit by idly while those who do not have access continue to become more disconnected. The free framework of sharing information and collectively owning and contributing to it is key to the digital justice concept that all individuals should have equal access to media and technology, and it is the only way that digital justice can be achieved. If we allow Major corporations that refuse to share their source code or coerce, indi coerce individuals into trading basic rights and liberties for no-cost services to continue their stranglehold on the world economy, we will never achieve digital justice and equality for everyone. If this becomes more common, and I believe it will, the case for a free framework and free software will be even greater. I'm standing up here today because I had a computer 
in my house and when I was very young. And I also had a computer in the classroom in the first grade. Um, the computer, this, this computer, my school, my teacher, it, it really empowered me. Uh, it, it empowered me to become interested in technology and my education. Uh, and I'm here because my, my dad, uh, a hardworking forester, decided on a whim to get a computer for my sister and I back in the early 90s um, so we could harness the power of the knowledge, and knowledge of the nascent World Wide Web and educational software. My father doesn't know this, but to me it's the most important financial choice and decision he ever made. Um, technology, it's, it's an incredibly empowering tool if it is utilized properly, and that is uh, for the common good. It's our responsibility as technophiles, geeks, nerds, academics, engineers, programmers, designers, advocates, and anyone else interested in digital justice to advocate for those that are digitally disconnected, to fight for free formats, to fight for free software, to fight for a free web, because it's rapidly becoming the backbone of our society. Some might argue that it already is. Um, and what good is knowledge and education if we don't share it, right? I have witnessed uh, through my volunteering and, and being involved in community projects um, what collective action and free software can really do for people uh, and communities. It's a really wonderful and touching feeling to see somebody interact with a computer for the first time, to help see someone give it over their fear and mystery of technology, to see a newly formed or veteran nonprofit or advocacy group get computer equipment that they really need so they can go and complete their mission and help other people. Or see a family get a computer for their child so they can have an economic and educational advantage. Um, so uh, in closing, before we have questions, uh, I ask that you join me in the fight for digital justice. Uh, I believe the future of our society depends on it. Um, and I'll close with a quote from uh, late historian Howard Zinn that said, small actions, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. So if anybody has any questions, throw them at me. Anyone? No?
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, you mentioned North Africa. You know, uh, I think things might have been a little bit harder to shut down if it was more decentralized and they weren't using proprietary frameworks like Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, might have been. I know that they used utilized Twitter, which uh, is another um, medium to communicate. But it, it's difficult to explain to people um, the negative aspects of. Uh, Software as a service, or services that you you know you trade liberties to, to use the software. You don't have full control over, um, and to me that stifles communication. Although it's as you mentioned, it's open and you can communicate. But I mean, who truly owns your communication? Yeah, that's that's something that um, we all should should uh, be cognizant of and, and let other people know about as well. Yeah. But thanks for your comment. Anybody have any other questions? Yes. Pay for wireless? OK. Um, I know I'd mentioned several several different ways. Um, what's that? Oh, sure. Um, you can contact an internet service provider. They're, uh, they might not be willing to work with you. Some are, some aren't. You just approach them, say, I'm trying to set up a wireless open mesh network and share it. My question is, should the taxpayers be paying? Oh, that's what your question is. Um, it, it it, it really depends on uh, the area. Um, are you asking me personally what I think should be done? Or, I mean, I think that there should be free basic internet service for everyone, yes. I think that there should be a tax for that, but that's my personal opinion. Now, other people are getting around that loophole with setting up open mesh wireless networks because they can't afford you know, a connection. Sure. Again, it depends on which framework you're using. If you're using open mesh wireless networks, several open mesh wireless networks, they have set up to where they have advertising on each web page, and they gain advertising revenue from that. Or they have a grant that they get from a foundation that pays for internet access for you know, five years. Or they set up business models around that. So there are different ways that you can pay for it. To me, that's the best way than having to tax somebody or write grants is to build into the open mesh wireless network framework from the start, a way to pay for it sustainably. Uh, and one of those ways is, is through advertising. I've seen that done quite a bit. Um, you know, you have a login page that you go to, right? And there's ads there. And that's how you pay for the internet. Or you can charge people a um, dollar or 50 cents, um, you know, that live in a subsidized housing block. Um, so there are different ways that you can pay for things. Um, taxation is, you know, it's an extreme measure to go to. Um, but I think the more grassroots, ways of doing it are probably more effective and more efficient. Yep. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, that's fine. Thank you for your comment. Question?
Yeah, that's sure. Yeah, I, I apologize for not repeating your question. Um, it, basically, there has been communication about how to extend um, internet access to people in communities, different methods of doing that. Um, you're saying that there's a necessity for this just because of the sheer amount of people that have to dial a phone number. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I feel that, that uh, you know, this concept of digital justice is so important because social services are all moving towards the internet. Not just, I mean, even social service, but just anything. You know, oh, do you have a website is one of the first things people think of. You know, or I'll just look you up on the web. If you don't have that, then you're kind of out. So, question right there? Yeah, so the question was, is how secure are free open networks? Is that kind of? Um, so how secure is, are, are the networks, uh, the open mesh? I mean, it really depends on how the network is set up. Um, some communities, they will have login information, you know, so it's restricted to the, the housing block that where the wireless mesh network is set up. Um, so it, it's really up to the people that are maintaining it. So um, you could have a very unsecure network or a very secure network. But again, that is an issue of, like, liberty. You know, you talk about you're on that network, so you're, you know, your traffic is going somewhere and somebody can sniff those packets for sure. Uh, it's definitely just something to consider uh, when talking about open, wi open mesh networks. Um, um, me, not necessarily. I would see what the people would want to do first. Um, uh, see what they would like. Uh, explain to them the issues involved and if they feel that they're comfortable with having that, then let them have that. Um, again, you know, I'm coming from a social work perspective, so we always communicate with individuals to see what their needs are and go with what they want, um, even if it might not be the best choice. Um, so. Sure. So how do we get people to um, see the value of the internet, the importance of the internet in their daily lives? Yeah, it's, um, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, some, in some ways, it's just when somebody hits a roadblock, they realize, you know, oh, I didn't need an internet access at this time, or they see a friend that has a computer. But um, the best way to do that is it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, um, I mean, you could. Sure, absolutely.
uh, the only thing I could think is advocacy, like you're talking about, uh, reaching out into communities, showing them um, the benefits of, of net access. But I mean, to me, it almost has to come at an individual level. You know, personal, individually, will have to realize, oh, I do need a computer, you know, or I do need internet, internet access. Um, that, that what I talked talk about costs in Athens. You know, a lot of people do want it, but they just can't afford it. It's too expensive. When, when you're living on uh, public assistance, you know, you can't you can't get by. You know, you got to pay other bills. And, it's hard to pay fifty dollars or forty-five dollars a month for internet. It's just too too expensive. Comment or question? Or you have to take a quiz or something, right? Some kind of test, yeah. yeah. So your, your question is, um, are there lobbying organizations around that protect, you know, like look for um, open source interests? Yeah, there's a, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They're a very active organization. They, Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, EFF.org. Uh, they're very, very involved in um, internet civil liberties, um, protecting people that go to court for like copyright infringement, whatever else you can think of. Um, and then, of course, there's the Free Software Foundation. Um, some people might argue how effective they are, but they are an organization that is representative of uh, free software. Um, but there's no particular like lobbying group that has an office in D.C. You know, that's like hanging out, like waiting to jump on legislation. Uh, that would be nice. It'd be really nice, but it's just not there. Um, and you asked about funding. Um, I think EFF, and anybody can jump in here, uh, EFF and FSF, um, they get mostly donations and they sell like products like t-shirts and books and other things. So I think a lot of it's donation and grant-based work. But there are organizations out there that are working towards, towards this. EFF is probably the, the best example I can think of personally. Um, anybody who's willing to chime in knows anything else can say so. Open Source for America, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Cool. I wasn't familiar with that. Thank you. Open source for America. Okay. Great. Any other questions, comments? Throw things at me. Um, no. Okay. Well. Oh, you have another. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah.
Yeah, so grassroots can, can hold you back. It can, but it can also be a great thing because it's, it's very uh, autonomous. You know, you can do a lot with it. The more you grow, the more you become tied to maybe grant. People that are funding you for grants, you know, you've got to answer to them, right? Um, so I think it's, it's been incredible the amount of work people have done together to have a completely free operating system that, that runs well, you know, better than some proprietary stuff. Just by, you know, volunteer work, some get paid, some don't. Um, but just the sheer aspect of sharing. And that's um, what I'd like for you know, everyone to come to today away with something, the concept that you know, there are people that, that need help and you can use free frameworks to do, do these things. Um, One more question. Sir. Yeah, spread the word about computer donations and look for organizations in your area. Don't ever throw a computer away. Mail it somewhere if you have to. Do we have another question? Um, no, I, I haven't. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you, you would. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting to find out, because from my impression to you, that it's, it had kind of fallen off. Um, yeah. So it's, right, yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah, it would be interesting to find out. Um, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's legislative, but I, I recently found a loophole that I'm going to try to get through. And um, this is a question about, you know, again, universities in a town, you know, there's a lot of stuff. They normally have computers just stacked on pallets. They just, like, you know, go off to um, be recycled or surplus, sold at auction, you know, that kind of thing. I got it. Um, so, there is a forum, maybe at the university, where are you? University. university you're in Athens? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is, um, there's a forum that, you know, they have different charitable organizations. We have to prove um, that we're serving a certain kind of population. So what we might have to do is, like, means test people um, so like, check to see what their income is. But once we do that, we get some data. We can throw it to the university, and then we can get access to all those computers that are there. That would solve our donation problem, like you're having. Need donations, right? Um, if there's a university or a community college near you, um, contact them and see what they can, can work out. Especially since you're under a 501c3, that always helps. Uh, you normally have to be a 501c3 nonprofit to do that kind of thing, um, to qualify as a charitable organization. But um, I'll, let me get your contact information before you leave and we'll talk. We did a small, small open mesh uh, in a low-income housing community. Yep, we did. Yep, so did we do, thank you for that. <laughs> did, have we implemented an open mesh wireless network? Yes, we have. Uh, very small, um, but it's been fairly successful. So, I mean, I don't know if you were involved with that or not, but yeah, we did. Um, we got some, uh, actually, the Clark County School District actually approached us about doing that, um, and we set up a small, small one, but I would like to see it done more. Um, so we found um, individuals within the housing community that were interested in becoming leaders in the community. They were already more likely leaders themselves anyway. Um, showed them how to set up the network, maintain it, uh, and they became the community li liaison for the Open Mesh Wireless Network. So exactly what I had talked about. Um, you teach people 
Um, it's very, very simple maintenance. You know, if something really goes wrong, they can always contact us. You know, we're in the community to help. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very small one. Um, I haven't heard much about it since then. I think there's no funding for it. You know, to continue. So. Just one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's one connection, but I think it's a, a larger, more business line. So you have higher bandwidth. You know. Everybody within like a certain part of the housing community gets access to that cloud because it's only going a certain way. You, know, you put more wireless mesh where outers, you can expand it more. Um, that's the beauty of it. You turn it on and it just kicks it over. So, yeah. Okay, well thank you all for coming. I think that's about it. Which part of Alabama do you live? Hey Drew. Thank you, I appreciate that. Oh. What about this? I can help with like that. Help we you. have the same problem. What would happen if you did like this? You gave me a I found idea. a problem. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with that. Really cool with that. Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.